Hey, back again. Wow, that was challenging, guys. Uh, loads of uh, internet problems here that I've encountered. I hope you can see me okay. I hope you can hear me okay. I hope I will stay with you in a sustainable way, sustainable in terms of <laughs> actually being able to be on the show rather than being kicked out. Sustainability has many different meanings environmental sustainability, leaving enough behind for future generations, economic sustainability, uh, not always good for the planet if we have continuous growth that extract more resources, but sustainability in terms of hopefully I'll be sustainably on the show. So I have the great pleasure to introduce Karen Ibasco, Miss Earth 2017. And Karen is an amazing lady. Uh, beauty and brain, as they say. And I was the judge of Miss Earth Philippines and uh, um, the eco intelligence judge of Miss Earth uh, Global 2017. So I really uh, was impressed already at that time. And Karen really made an impact during her reign. So it's great to have her on the show. I hope you're still backstage, Karen, uh, and can come with me. Yeah. Hi. Hi good evening, Sorry, everyone. Good evening, Matthias. Yes, good evening. Sorry, I left you alone for such a long while there backstage. My it's internet okay. was, uh, giving me all sorts of headaches. <laughs> Experience that, was... that before. Don't worry. Oh yeah, but uh, here we are uh, with Miss Earth 2017, Karen Ibasco. How are you, Karen? I'm doing great. I'm doing a lot better now. And yeah, I'm just happy to be here. Very honored to see you again and to connect with you again online. It's been a while. And I'm happy to be on the show and to see, not perhaps personally, but I just know that there is a huge amount of audience listening to us right now. That's great. That's wonderful. Excellent. And I'm sure they want to uh, know things from you in terms of mm -hmm. uh, sustainability, renewable. Mm -hmm. Uh, low carbon lifestyle but first you just mentioned you are better now for those that don't know uh as so many people on the planet uh karen was hit by this um thing out there the uh, virus that has been affecting all of our lives now from first-hand experience like what can you recommend to people in terms of uh protection against the virus and then if you have been infected what wh what do you do Actually, first thing I want to tell people is that when you go out, always wear your mask. You know, a lot of people don't like wearing their mask because it's uncomfortable. But if I were you, you know, I will not um, think of more on fashion, but to compromise my safety. You know, you can still be fashionable, but never compromise your safety because it's very important. You know, there's so many people that have not overcome COVID once they have it. So I'm just grateful that my whole family was able to overcome it. Um, we, we honestly don't know where we got it until now, but we believe it's from deliveries because we're very, very careful. And once you start experiencing the symptoms, it's good that um, you jot down every single day what are you feeling. And it's better to get swapped because that's the only way for you to know if you have the virus or not. So you can get prevented. And if ever you will have further symptoms, you can go to the hospital and the hospital will take care of you because a lot of people, they don't know they have it. And then they will contract uh, complications in their houses. And when sometimes when you're you know, at a critical level, it's harder to help you in that way. So it's, it's good that to, it's good actually to know at an early age on early stage yeah. so they can actually help you yeah yeah the the, the sooner you have clarity the more mm. you can take the appropriate actions i mean in germany as well uh my family there my brother's daughter uh, she had mm -hmm. to have a swab test as well done yeah. last week because one of her colleagues at uh, work uh got infected fortunately oh. she wasn't infected but the whole system is basically you have to do social distancing. My brother couldn't visit my mom anymore. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, but fortunately, uh, it wasn't the case. But it's really amazing what impact it had and how many lives it has affected. On the flip side, you've seen once the cars are standing in the garage, once the lorry 
are on the yard, the jeepneys are uh, at the home. Wow, wasn't that amazing how the air quality improved? Definitely. And um, people really saw that there is a huge impact to the actions of people when it comes to the environment. And I really hope that, you know, when, when everything gets back to normal, when the vaccines are mass, produ mass produced and then distributed to people, I hope that they will not forget, you know, how important it is for us to protect the planet and everything that we do has an effect to the environment. So it's a good thing for us to always remember. Yes, definitely. The, the human connection, uh, us humans, we are the source of the pollution, our mobility. So, uh, yeah, I'm really happy, Karen, that all of your family members came through this. Let's mm -hmm. just have a quick look at our uh, audience tonight. We've got a couple of people that are sending in their greetings. Uh, excellent again to see the guys from the Pinoy Scout TV. Ian oh, Joseph, wow. hi. Welcome. We've got Jay as well from the uh, Pinoy Scout TV, Neptune. They are always great, reliable followers. That's excellent. We have uh, my good friend, Marxist Lenin, there as well. He's host at Sustainable PH as well. So it's great. Kathy, wonderful. Kathy, good to see you here. Then we have uh, Baby Joe. Uh, he, uh, the comment is, he, he loves you so much. <laughs> Very eloquent you. Queen. Yes. <laughs> We agree. We agree. Eloquent, uh, both in appearance and in communication. So, you. Karen, you really uh, struck the audiences, both at Miss Earth Philippines and Miss Earth Global, mm -hmm. with your intelligent and measured answers, which were answers to the questions rather than just general answers. I mean, sometimes you see that, you know, at, at events or pageants, mm -hmm. there are answers. The question, uh, the, the response is kind of related, but it's not really answering the question. So yeah. how were you able to make that happen? You didn't seem to be nervous. You were coming up with a measured response to the question. What is mm -hmm. your secret? <laughs> well, honestly, I think, um, I, I experienced the same thing as a normal person would, you know, um, you get normal, I, you get nervous in front of a lot of people and that's normal. But one thing I can truly say to people, do not let your nervousness go ahead of you. Because even though you know what you're going to say, but if you get nervous and then you, it, it, you let it go ahead of you, you're going to stutter, you're going to forget what you're going to say. And um, you're going to look at the people and their reaction. So if I were you, if you're going to answer, even though it's not in a beauty pageant, perhaps you're going to present, it's good to look at it in one direction or um, in the farthest side of the room if you're not comfortable looking other people in the eyes. And just remember that that time is given to you. So you can just utilize it to share what you have and then what you prepared for. Because, mm. you know, you... you just um, memorize, you're going to forget it. And if you don't remember the single word that you memorized, you're going to forget the whole thing. So one thing um, that I can add to that is that I do not memorize my answers. That's true. I do not memorize at all. <laughs> I, think, I think that is great because, uh, you know, uh, those contestants that memorize their answers give often answers that are actually not answering the question. Yeah. And, you know, I can pick that up. And for me, that means a couple of points less. You yeah. know, if you are if you are giving a memorized answer, you know, I, I will I will basically take off a couple of points. I want someone like what you did that can answer the question. And I still remember vividly when we had the Miss Earth uh, um, Philippines final. Mm -hmm. and there was uh, our good friend Rodney. Uh, at that time, he was the head of climate reality in the Philippines. Yeah. He was asking you a very tough question. Very, very <laughs> tricky question. Can you still remember it? Honestly, I, I can't remember. But I could remember that he was in the panel. But I couldn't yes. specifically know. Uh, I can't remember specifically what his question was. But I can remember your question to me. I can't forget that. Really? <laughs> I, I have forgotten my question, but I can remember Rodney's question because really? I thought, wow, 
He is asking you such a tough question, politically sensitive question, but the way you answered it was like very measured, very balanced, without upsetting anyone. Because it was one of those remember. questions. Sorry. What was the question? Yeah. I couldn't remember. <laughs> it was something along the lines of, you know, now with the new uh, uh, um, uh, head of the DNR coming in, what would be your recommendation for the mining industry uh, mm. to basically, you know, um, stop the mining? Or, or yeah. it, was, it was a heavy question. And you were yeah. like very much, you're talking about, okay, let's try and come up with sustainable mining. Yes, we need to uh, 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 stop and restrict mining there where it really has a bad impact on the environment. Yeah. You were giving like a, 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 a two-sided answer that was basically, mm -hmm. you know, reflecting uh, everybody's views mm -hmm. rather than, because in the Philippines, that was a very sensitive topic at that time. But yeah. what, was, what was the question I asked you? I can't remember that. I can't remember it. You asked me um, because you knew that I was a scientist. So you were asking me, how can you explain climate change to a five-year-old kid? That was your question to me. <laughs> I, couldn't remember. I couldn't forget that question. <laughs> wow. Okay. So now for all of our listeners out there, how would you uh, explain climate change to a five-year-old kid? I should get my daughter in. She's three and a half years in. I'll, <laughs> I'll play this to her in one and a half years' time, okay? Karen. Okay. Well, honestly, one of the things that I can truly say to people is that, you know, when I was in college, my professor told me that if you are a good speaker and a lecturer, even a five-year-old kid could understand what you're trying to say. So I can explain climate, climate change to a five-year-old kid in a way or in a perfect analogy as a human body. The human body, as a kid, just like you, you need heat for you to become alive. But sometimes, because of the external things that you do, you eat too much ice cream, you don't sleep on time, and you play so much video games beyond your time, you can actually have a fever because you don't listen and you do all these things in excess. So when you exceed even one degree Celsius with your body you're actually having a fever and it's like climate change is similar with you having a fever it's like the planet is also having a fever i hope i was nice. able to explain that <laughs> nice it's like storytelling right yes you're relating it to things that people can easily understand, understand. easily grasp so that is excellent that's that's really great Thank yeah you. yeah i i like that i like that how does our audience like that explanation any comments from our audience how do you like the explanation that Karen just gave? Um, okay, yeah, we had that comment from uh, Raf. Uh, I love this talk. That's great. That's good. Good to see. Uh, I'm wondering how you guys like uh, Karen's explanation of climate change <laughs> for the children. That's a good one. You know, relating to stories. And mm -hmm. uh, I know you've been giving a lot of talks in the Philippines. You've been communicating as well internationally. Sam says, I loved it. Very good. Yeah, we've got a fever. The planet's got a fever. Um, you have been speaking on behalf of WWF, mm -hmm. the Climate Change Commission. You've represented the Philippines at the UN. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've really gone from strength to strength in articulating the message out there. We were both together in an event hosted by a Singapore company two weeks ago where yes. we were both speakers in an online event. So uh, where is your career going in the future? You know, you're a public speaker. Yeah. Now we do virtual speaking. What's your vision for the next few years? Oh, well, that's good. Well, honestly, I'm pursuing this as a profession um, speaking and i want to focus specifically more on the environment and at the same time image consultancy and i'm planning to fuse both since that's a good that's a great brand for miss earth i can really help people more on the image side and on communications at the same time with etiquette protocol and civility and then combining it as well with sustainability i cannot leave that one behind you know a lot of people just win the crown and forget what miss earth is all about but Ever since uh, I won and I knew what the planet is going through, you know, I cannot turn a blind eye and just continue on with my life as if I didn't know anything. You know, um, it's one thing that I always want to carry with me because 
now I understand and I want to make people aware of what I understand now. Beautiful, beautiful. I love it. And I totally agree with that. It's so important, you know, that the mission you have embarked on when you became Miss Earth Philippines, Miss Earth Global, that you carry that torch into the future and combining it with other aspects, I think is, is really great. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mir Mir Miri Mar as well says she loves the super, super simple explanation of climate change. <laughs> Adults and kids will easily get it. Spot on, spot on. <laughs> so you are a speaker that people can understand. Wonderful. During your uh, campaign and rain time, one of your main advocacy focus was renewable energies. Mm -hmm. So where are we in the Philippines now with renewables and how can we enhance it on a national level, on a company level and personal level? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, um, sometimes, you know, when we talk about renewable energy, you really need to do it in a massive scale. But sometimes you can still do it in a micro scale. You know, I still have um, the gift that you've given me, uh, the one that has um, a bubble and then you can turn into a light and there's a solar panel on top of it. I always have um, similar and very simple items like that at home and I keep it. So I don't need to use any flashlights if there's an emergency. But when it comes to renewable energy um, in a massive scale or in a macro scale in the Philippines, you really need to talk with the government with that. Um, and I believe that slowly the Philippines is opening up and understanding the importance of it. And recently I, I listened to the speech of the UN Secretary General and um, he really talked um, all about, not all, but some of it when it comes to renewable energy that one day people will understand it's not just good environmentally, but also economically. So hopefully yes. not just the Philippines, but the whole world would understand that it's important for us to invest and slowly transition to renewable energy because we really need to do our part now. Um, the planet is heating up very fast. And if we do not do our part as early as now, the next generation will be the one to experience everything, not us anymore. And I really want to do everything that I can now in my generation to help them because I don't want them to tell me in the future, why didn't you do anything to help us? You know, yes. I, I will never, if, if it happened now in my generation, I might say the same thing um, to my previous generation. You know, why didn't you do anything to help us? Like we are the ones who's going to suffer and I don't want that to happen in the future. Great, wonderful. Uh, that's a good message for my two children as well, which you know, <laughs> uh, you met Princess Athena. Oh, and yes. uh, thanks for sharing with her that you will train her when she has yeah. her own Miss Earth journey, should yeah. she embark on it. So hopefully she will do that. And mm -hmm. then she has a great trainer already uh, lined up in, in Karen. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. We have as well here the comment from uh, Raf E.R., uh, who says, I'm a biological science teacher and I love to share these words to my students and educate them more about climate change. That's beautiful. So you've inspired a teacher here and Thank given you. the teacher uh, a new way of articulating and sharing it. And I think you made a lovely connection there. We want to even ramp up renewables for the sake of our children. But renewables is not just uh, uh, an investment game anymore. It's a return game. Renewables in terms of cost per kilowatt hour are outperforming, starting to outperform uh, against coal and other non-renewables. Uh, India last year scrapped a lot of plants for coal-fired power plants mm -hmm. because they realized that large-scale solar, large-scale wind is actually cheaper per kilowatt hour. So we are already there. now. Do you measure your carbon footprint, Karen? What do you do about reducing your own carbon footprint? Well, personally, I don't, I don't uh, personally calculate everything, but because mm -hmm. of the things that I did before and because of the things that I do know now, I know how specifically I do conservation of energy. You know, when somebody in the house doesn't turn off, you know, as simple as gadgets or they leave their lights open and then I don't see anyone in the room, they would see me get angry. And I would mm -hmm. honestly turn it off every single time until you get it. <laughs> I want you to mm -hmm. understand it's, it's actually important for you to conserve, not just for the sake of your electricity bills, but I want them to understand the environmental side of it. 
at the same time, um, honestly, I don't like using plastics. It's one thing. It's it's made of oil. I don't like it because you cannot get rid of it in the environment. It becomes microplastics. It's not good as much as possible when I go out there. I always have my uh, reusable items. Either it's straws or if I don't have it, I don't use my straws. And I always have my eco bags. I'm very now allergic to plastics, <laughs> like before. Um, I don't care about plastics before, but now it's a huge issue since a lot of people are just in their houses and everyone is so freaked out with the virus. Everything is encapsulated with plastics and a single use plastics is just getting rampant nowadays. And I want people to understand that it's something that you really need to avoid and we can easily avoid it no matter how old you are. So, um, so, so far, those are the things that I'm very, very conscious of. And, um, of course, planting trees is important. And uh, one thing that I understand is there are um, activities for the organizations that I'm with. Um, I also ask them questions about it. And uh, what are the perfect trees to plant? Like what specific time of the year you have to do it? What place you have to do yeah. it in? It's not just simply planting anything that you want. <laughs> Stuff like mm. that. Yeah, so those are some great tips. Try and cut down on your electricity bill saves you money if you have less uh, power consumption it's tricky during the lockdown because we do more work at home uh, mm -hmm. we have more time and, and people staying at home so that's a little bit of a challenge uh we got a new aircon we bought an inverter aircon uh, yeah. that's as well a little tip then planting trees local mm -hmm. trees then try to avoid the plastic use your own yeah. packaging I always make a little bit of drama if I go shopping and they give me a paper bag. I'm like, oh, don't cut the tree. Please save the tree. So I make it a little bit theatralic. Maybe they think, oh, this foreigner is crazy. But uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think one thing as well, food choices. Mm, the, yes, I was about to say that. <laughs> general, um, green, vegetarian, yeah. vegan. I mean, we we all have different different things. I always say to people, uh, uh, don't worry, you don't need to be perfect. I'm not perfect. Uh, yeah. You know, Karen is not perfect. Uh, we don't need to be a hundred percent perfect, but take steps towards uh, lowering your negative environmental impact and yeah. enhancing your positive environmental impact. You know, we can celebrate the positive side. We can be healers of Mother Nature. So, yeah. guys who are watching out there, if you've got any questions on the subject or for Karen, bring it on. We've got time to answer some questions. Uh, we will continue our chit chat. But as relevant questions come in, uh, we will uh, uh, be open for that and we will tackle them. John Ray as well says hi to you, Karen. Um, Queen Karen. Yeah. So uh, it's nice to get greetings from people in between. For for me here. You know, I have seen that now with us staying at home, uh, my travel environmental impact, particularly the flight that I used to do, has gone down to virtually zero. Mm -hmm. And so my overall environmental impact, I calculated, it's about 15 tons of carbon dioxide per year. And the majority of that 10 tons or more is usually flight related. Mm -hmm. So this year, my carbon footprint will be much lower and I, I have made on the UNFCCC website the pledge, go climate neutral now. And you're already very closely connected with the UN. Maybe you can as well uh, uh, have a look at that website and, um, you know, make that pledge. And then at the end of the year, I just uh, um, cut down, uh, calculate and buy some carbon credits to make my life climate neutral. So that's I'll, I'll send you the link, Karen. Or maybe I'll, okay. I'll post it in the com comment box. Uh, it's a personal pledge, and it's a great initiative. Hi, Kathy. Uh, yeah, great to see you here on Sustainable PH. Karen, uh, another greeting from one of your fans. That's great. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, actually, if you guys Google UNFCCC, mm -hmm. go climate neutral now, you can find that campaign. You can sign up to it. You can make the pledge. Because my belief is if we are all climate neutral, then we can solve the problem. We just need okay. 7 billion humans going climate neutral. Then yeah. we have no more climate change problem. <laughs> yeah. Actually. So, 
what other eco campaigns have you been uh, involved in in uh, uh, the time since uh, your reign as Miss Earth Qu Global Queen after mm -hmm. you handed over your reign? Um, after I handed it over, I really wanted to continue it. So I know there are other people that go through uh, or go to different um, NGOs and perhaps helping with the government. But honestly, um, I went to WWF Philippines or they were the ones to also help me out. And I'm one of their ambassadors now. And we focus on a lot of things as well. And I'm happy because they put me on energy and climate. <laughs> so it's one topic that I also like. And uh, one project that I really like with them is the Earth Hour. It's something that um, I really understand and uh, I really push through for people to understand that every single day, every single hour is Earth Hour and not just for that specific time. And um, uh, one thing that I also do, I became the Youth Ambassador of the Climate Change Commission and that's how I got connected with the UN. And I'm just happy because I'm learning so much more, you know, um, learning should never stop. And sometimes um, D and R would, would collaborate and I would love to help them all the time. They're, they're a good branch of the government and they really do their part. And um, yeah, I continually learn and I, I do I go through lectures from WWF and I, I learn a lot from Green Man continuously, even until now. I'm, I'm very inspired with everything that he does. We we do we we do our mission right. We uh, follow our mission. So uh, uh, and and that is really the important thing. And I think you experience the same, Karen. If mm -hmm. we are true to our mission in life, and in your case, it's uh, a combination of sustainability and uh, etiquette and image. Yeah. Then we can be happier, right? When we do that, we've got a, a comment here uh, from Dr. Sajid Manji. Ordinary uh, cement provides CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. Can we promote composite cements that could reduce CO2 emissions? Okay, he, it's a very technical question. No yeah. surprise, because Dr. Sajid has a PhD <laughs> on cementitious materials. Uh, any comments on that, Karen? I, I might have some comments on that, but I'll, I'll, I'll give ladies first. Oh, okay. Well, to be honest, <laughs> I didn't know that before. I learned that from you, Green Man. I learned that from you. And um, I learned that, wow, there's so many constructions happening all around the world. You know, there's a lot of people also going into this industry. And then people like you who understand more on the chemistry side and more on the material side. And that's when I, I learned that cement can also uh, emit so much carbon in the atmosphere based on the things that you use, the raw materials and how everything is going to be produced. And yeah, I would give the floor to you because you can explain more to our audience with that. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Karen. Yeah, you you always know how to uh, to make it work. Yes, you're actually right. I I I have done a lot of stuff on that, uh, and uh, uh, maybe we'll we'll wait with Raf's comment uh, for a while. I'll just answer the um, cement comment, and then we can bring uh, Raf's question in. Um, Cement is basically the burning of limestone. Limestone is calcium carbonate, CaCO3. Mother Earth captured the CO2 in the physical form of the calcium carbonate. And when we are burning that to manufacture cement, we need about a temperature of 1,500 Celsius. That 1,500 Celsius then requires a lot of fuel. Usually people use uh, coal. So it's a double whammy. The chemical formula is the release of carbon dioxide from the carbonate to CO2 okay. and the release of carbon dioxide from the burning of the coal mm -hmm. or alternative uh, fuel. Alternative fuel can slightly reduce it. What Dr. Sajid is talking about, the composite cements, is basically cements where you are replacing the ordinary Portland cement, that is what comes out of these gigantic cement kilns where you have the high CO2. You can replace it with fly ash, which is a byproduct of coal fired power plants, mm -hmm. or with blast furnace slag, that's a byproduct of steel making, or even with so called natural porcelanic materials. Then you slash the carbon footprint massively. 
because the fly ash or the blast furnace slag has a CO2 emission of close to zero because it's considered a waste byproduct process. So this is what Dr. Sajid is referring to. And mm -hmm. yes, I agree with him. There is actually an amazing cement production in the Philippines called Big Boss Cement in Pampanga, which is one of the best technologies I've seen for low carbon cement. They use the lahar from Mount Pinatubo okay. as one of their main raw materials. And then uh, there is another company in the Philippines, Potsolanic. They distribute the fly ash all over the country to exactly do what Dr. Sajid suggested, the composite cements. So it's happening already. It can happen even more, but it's a very essential contribution. The normal ordinary Portland cement is uh, uh, not eco-friendly. Uh, we need those composite cements. So excellent point there. Now, uh, we had from our friend from Sure Consultancy, it's a good thing that the Philippine Congress recently declared climate emergency. I yeah. agree. That really puts it at another level. But then we have the question uh, from Raf ER, Ms. Karen, why is sustainable development so often associated with protecting the environment? Oh, why? Because everything that we do has an effect to the planet, practically. And um, even before, you know, during the pre-industrial times, um, when machineries are, during the pre-industrial times, when machineries made our lives easier. But sometimes, you know, when you um, do it in excess, um, that's a time that it gets um, really in a bad way and it really affects the planet. And now people are experiencing that effect after 100 years. And um, it's terrible because we are the ones who are suffering. And the sustainability is one thing that we always want to achieve as a goal. We don't want to destroy uh, the planet. You know, I'm not against science. I'm a scientist, but we need to understand to always balance science and also the effect to the environment. You know, you can always use science to make better the planet and to make better the lives of people. But you cannot only be on one side because when that happens, this is what we're experiencing now. And um, scientists are also the ones that are doing their part for us to counteract the effects of what the previous scientists have done. Or when the creations of all these machineries that perhaps were not foreseen, um, these are the things that we're experiencing now. So yeah, I believe uh, sustainability is one thing that we always have to make um, as a goal. And it's always connected to the environment. And we always need to remember that everything that we do has a connection to the environment. Yes, yes, yes. And there are many hearts for your answers oh, from the person you. who uh, asked the question. That's wonderful. And uh, Dr. Sajad as well, he is actually uh, um, following us from Pakistan. Oh, and wow. he has actually made a PhD on cementitious materials. He suggests we inbox him. I think, Dr. Sajad, it's better you inbox me. Uh, because I might not find you later on. Do it now if you can mm -hmm. see my uh, Facebook name there, because sometimes it's difficult later on to, to track this. So uh, give me a message. I actually co-founded a company in Germany that does eco-friendly building materials. So that's why I know a little bit about the carbon footprint of cement and uh, cement replacement. And mm -hmm. he says here, thank you very much Appropriate for a pro appropriately describing composite cements and appreciating for such a wonderful program. Yeah, maybe you were taken by surprise, right? That I know a little <laughs> bit about that subject as well. Uh, I, I have a master in environmental science. I'm not a guru on uh, cement uh, science, but you know, you learn as you go along. And I think that's as well the same what you've experienced, Karen, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, and I know you've even been a lecturer at Santa Thomas University, right, on, on yeah. science. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, go go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I focused actually, you know, I was waiting for someone during Miss Earth to ask me this question because I thought that they knew what my master's was. Uh, actually, my master's is focused more on the medical side, but we actually mm. use radioactive sources and external beams to help cancer patients and other patients mm. to actually diagnose um, the sicknesses in their bodies. But I was waiting for someone during Miss Earth to ask me a question if I would be pro a nuclear power plant or not, because I, I can actually work 
if ever in the future, to be a health physicist inside a nuclear power plant. But, um, you know, I understand that, um, I understand the science behind it and it's amazing, but I've seen what are the accidents that have happened in the past. And personally in the Philippines, um, we're just so prone to climate change. And um, if there's a better alternative, I would choose that. I would choose renewable energy more than nuclear power plant, even though it's gonna be, it's a it's a huge release of so much energy. And then there's a, a very, what do you call this? The bill would be really would really go down, but then I cannot take the risk of having accidents and the leaks of radioactive sources in the air and in the water. Um, it's just terrible, you know. I've seen it happen in Japan, and they were so prepared. They have so many backups. But then sometimes, you know, when you don't foresee everything, and then the the things that happens in the climate, and then what happens? Are, are we ready if something like that happened in the Philippines? I'm not questioning about the credibility of opening a nuclear power plant. I'm just not sure if we're ready if accidents happen in the Philippines. You know, it's really scary, and it's something that you have to foresee, and it's a possibility it can happen in the Philippines. So that's just my side on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wow. Uh, you know, I, I'm in agreement with you on that one because uh, I was a, a school kid when Chernobyl blew up mm -hmm. and yeah. we couldn't eat our vegetables from our own garden anymore. Yeah. And um, in Germany, the government is exiting nuclear power, even mm -hmm. though it has a low carbon footprint in operational yeah. terms. Yeah. You have the risks, you have the end of life of nuclear waste, yeah. you have the cost of decommissioning a nuclear power plant. And yes. the German government has asked every company owning a nuclear power plant to set aside 5 billion euro, not million, billion to decommission the nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, those companies have to pay the government for taking care of the nuclear waste. So if yes. you take all of that into consideration, it's so much more expensive yeah. than what people originally thought it would be. So uh, nuclear is already beating those prices. If you really calculate the cost per uh, kilowatt hour, you can check that on Wikipedia if you yeah. take the cost of end of life into consideration. So we've got uh, uh, a couple of other comments here. Sam Well is asking, with the Congress declaring climate emergency in the Philippines, what will happen next? What should we expect as an ordinary citizen in this country? That's a tough uh, question. Mm -hmm. Well, specifically, I don't know, but I'm just happy that climate crisis, uh, the climate emergency was already declared. I'm not in the side. I'm not, I, I really don't know what are the steps of the government, but I'm looking forward to that as well. But it's one thing that we, um, I understand that we have to continually do uh, a lower carbon lifestyle and they would, they will be the ones to implement policies for us to understand. You know, it's important that the government government would always do their part because, you know, if they do something, people will be mandated to do it as well. <laughs> and sometimes yeah. it's better because I, I love doing talks like this, but it can reach a specific audience only. But if the government comes into the picture and they make it a policy or as a law, people will be pushed and... Um, you know, they will be pushed to follow because it's already a policy. They will be mandated to follow it. So the fact that the Philippines have already declared um, the climate emergency is a good thing because this previous month, there were two typhoons that has hit us so much. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people's lives that were affected. Um, they lost all their properties and some lives were taken away. So it's something that we really have to do our part. And the government also did their part. So I'm actually happy to see that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think that is, I, I totally agree with you on that one, Karen. Mm -hmm. uh, it is an acknowledgement of the severity of the situation. Yeah. And it's an acknowledgement that there is a climate crisis, not just a natural fluctuation. Uh, it is a human-made climate crisis. I read somewhere that the uh, government will now have to increasingly take into consideration uh, climate resilience, climate emergency aspect of budgets. When people at a regional or national level uh, put budgets together, what is the component there with regards to climate emergency? And I think it will strengthen the Philippines' position in the international discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, the climate emergency is here. 
it's not mainly the Filipino people that are the reason for the climate emergency. It's the world as a whole. It's the Western countries uh, who accumulatively have had the highest volume of emissions over the last 200 years. So they should become even more responsible. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can say for Europe, that is uh, partially the case. For North America, we had a little uh, withdrawal of responsibility there. Mm -hmm. But I think changing political realities, that commitment might come back. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think the climate emergency declaration is, is a powerful uh, uh, aspect. So uh, Abdul is saying here, Abdul Haq is saying great discussion uh, and uh, Faye is saying very good Queen Karen. Uh, um, she, the, she loves your comments. We have uh, um, the sure consultancy here is asking whether Dr. Sajib has a thumb rule approximately how much CO2 is reduced per cub cubic meter if we replace conventional concrete with composite concrete on average. Good question, interesting question. Um, at the moment, the uh, uh, CO2 contribution of cement is about 7 to 8 percent of the world's CO2 emissions. It's more than double of all the planes together before mm. COVID. We talk always about planes, but it's actually uh, cement. And here, Dr. Sachit is answering that. This is interesting as well. We have our audience mm -hmm. uh, uh, questions. <laughs> yes, yes. If we replace 10 to 20 percent of the ordinary Portland cement, then we would reduce the submissions. Yeah, one ton of cement is one ton of carbon dioxide. Spot on. Mm -hmm. We replace 20 percent. We are reducing it by um, 20 percent. So mm -hmm. from one ton down to 800 kilogram uh, as, a, as a ballpark figure. So it's a one to one replacement. You would need to take into consideration the transportation cost of the fly ash, mm -hmm. uh, the carbon footprint, or of the blast furnace slag. But if it comes from locally, it's uh, virtually a, a, a zero carbon footprint. So um, great, great, yeah. And Achi is saying exactly, Karen, this must be fully implemented and integrated uh, yeah. within our education. Micro effect becomes a macro effect. <laughs> Bottom up, top down, bring it on. So yes, great. Uh, we had a, a, a wonderful discussion. We had a lot of great inputs. We had a lot of great comments and questions from the audience. So Karen, your uh, final recommendation for everybody. What should we do uh, maybe on a daily basis or strategically mm -hmm. to make our contribution and maybe to turn our life from a burden to the planet <laughs> to a healing impact on the planet? Uh -huh. Oh, thank you for having me on the show. Well, honestly, one thing I can truly say now that you know better and people are more aware, I hope that you would also invest not just um, for yourself, but also invest for the next generation. So everything that you do now has an effect to the planet. So it's important for us to make it a goal and make it a lifestyle, uh, which is green lifestyle, and at the same time to really push for sustainability, even in small ways that we do every single day. You know, it starts small. Now that people are more aware, people um, are really doing their part. And even the government is actually seeing it. So it's good that we're on the same boat more and more. And I hope that you would continue your journey with us and that you won't stop. Great, wonderful. Wise words to uh, leave us uh, with. Thank you so much, Karen Ibasco, Miss Earth Global 2017. Lovely to see you again. Thanks for gracing our podcast uh, here at Sustainable PH with your presence and with your inspirational input. Uh, we love you here in the Philippines. Uh, uh, you have fans all over the world. Thanks for your contribution to the planet. And uh, see you all again in two weeks' time, guys, for the next Green Man podcast. Bye-bye. <laughs>